This is Will from Cigar Coop, and I am at the 2012 IPCPR trade show, and I'm here with the one and only Chief Haba, aka Skip Martin of Roma Craft Tobacco. Roma Craft Tobacco. Yep. So uh, Skip, are, are you getting my skinny side here? Um, I think uh, you know the camera. You know, they always say it adds a few pounds, right? Yeah, a few. Right. So Skip, first of all, it's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, um, good to meet you. I know uh, I've heard of your name for a while, and this is the first time we've actually got to meet this week. And uh, yeah, uh, well, I mean, we've seen each other a couple times this week, but right. uh, I mean, I was really uh, flattered by or humbled by you know you listing us as one of the the five boutiques to watch or five small companies to watch. Uh, I don't know if we really consider ourselves a boutique, but I mean, we're definitely a small craft cigar company and. Uh, I really appreciate you putting us on that list. No problem. I appreciate some of the great feedback you gave about your company, and we'll talk a little more about that today. Sure, sure. Yeah, excellent. So, uh, Skip, how did um, how did you come into uh, Roma Craft Tobacco? Yeah, so, I mean, this is kind of a... I, I think a lot of people kind of know the story, but... Uh, we got the announcements. Yes. So, uh, I had a retail store in Galveston, Texas. I guess before that, I was a, a regular cigar smoker. And uh, a friend of mine got involved in a cigar store, and uh, I, I started working with him. And then I did that for about three years. Uh, the, the store closed after Hurricane Ike, and uh, I kind of, kind of dig myself out of that hole. I started working uh, with with Camacho to do more of a, a limited edition cigar, a house cigar that we'd been producing. So uh, when those supplies kind of started running low. I started working with my uh, my buddy in Austin, Mike Rosales, who at the time had uh, Adrian's Costa Rican Imports uh, making the Adrian's uh, line of cigars. And we started working on a blend together, and Costa Rica didn't really work out. We moved up to Nicaragua. Uh, in Nicaragua, we, we met a, another uh, friend of ours who kind of was interested in working uh, together. His name's Esteban Disla, uh, great, great tobacco guy. Uh, knows every job in a factory and uh, we started working with him making cigars in his house like a little chin chow and uh, we made about 5,000 cigars which were really meant to be for me and for my old customers to kind of get mail order uh, that was the original Pro Magnet uh, those came in I had told some people on Twitter that I was going to have those uh, and people asked if we could do pre-orders so uh, when they actually came out at the end of February they were sold. It took us longer to pack them than it took us to sell them. So they were gone in about three, you know, about four days. So we immediately called back down to, to Esteban and said, "Hey, I think we're gonna have to roll some more." He figured we figured those would last a couple of months, you know. So he rolled another five thousand, and it took it had t- it had taken you know it took another two months for those to be ready. And we said, "Look, why don't you just start rolling about five thousand a month?" And every month they came in. Uh, we were selling them. So after the third month, we said, hey, we need, probably need to start doing about 10000 And somewhere right in there, we ran out of, we ran out of uh, tobacco, uh, out of Broadleaf. A little bit I know, you couldn't just go pick it up anytime you wanted, you know. So we, we picked out some, uh, some tobacco. Um, you know, it was a pretty significant investment, uh, pretty, a lot of money, actually. And at that, if we wanted to make the, that cigar consistently, we had to buy the supply that was available. And when we, when we got into a situation where we had to make that kind of investment, we started more seriously talking about, hey, well, what is this really going to be? So that's when we decided to also pick up the Habano and to start working on the Attempters line. So, um, you know, long story short, it's, I kind of stumbled in this a little bit at a time, but um, I love it and, and uh, it seems like it's been well received and, you know, it's, it's just... You know, who, who could ask more than to kind of be doing this for a living, right? So absolutely, absolutely. It, every time, every time I uh, talk to uh, or send an email to, to my partner in in uh, Nicaragua, I always end with you know Vivian Dos Los It's like you know living the dream every day, man. Right. Every day. Exactly. So Pro Magnum was that Broadleaf, which was the first series that you launched. Yep. And then you followed up with the uh, Habano, which was the Aquitaine. Actually, the next cigar we did was the Intemperance. So, was the Intemperance? Was was the uh, the Ecuador and the Atapuraca Intemperance, the uh, you know kind of the, the prohibition based line. Right. And then um, we sold those for for about six months, waiting for the tobacco to be ready for the for the Cro Magnet and for the Aquitaine. Right. And those actually 
officially don't come out until September. Uh, but we are launching it uh, here at the show, and we're launching it uh, at the Burns uh, Tweet Up in Chattanooga uh, on August 23rd. Excellent. So you and I were talking a little earlier. Why don't you tell a little story about um, the Intemperance and uh, how you named those cigars, because I think it was a great story. Yeah, so Intemperance, uh, we, we've been tossing this around for a while. Uh, I'm, I'm a kind of a history uh, reader, uh, and uh, I've read a lot about the Prohibition movement in terms of the parallels to kind of the modern the modern anti-smoking uh, movement. And so what, we, what we've done is, is we decided to take this political poster uh, that was by A.D. Fillmore, which was uh, called The Tree of Intemperance, and based the line around this side, the, the, uh, the, the period between the 18th Amendment and the 21st Amendment, in which, you know, alcohol was prohibited. Not a lot of people know, but uh, in the temperance movement uh, actually was a, a, a movement, um, a religious movement, and a movement by uh, suff women suffragists uh, against, uh, you know, the evils of tobacco and alcohol. And uh, they successfully banned uh, the alcohol piece, but at the time, tobacco was was huge. I mean, 85 percent of the people in the of men in the country smoked cigars in the late 1800s, so probably 50 percent in the 1900s, uh, 1920s. So, kind of similar. You know, fast forward about you know 80, 90 years. Now we're kind of in the opposite situation, where alcohol is very mainstream. Right. And, and you know people don't really mess with it that much, uh, but the, the the kind of the temperance movement today is really against tobacco. We're the bad guys now, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's like the tyranny of the majority right. uh, against you know a right. small minority. Right. And and for for a large part, it's because they don't really understand the premium cigar business. Uh, so that's that's what that branding is based on. Excellent. And we have a couple of samples of the uh, aqu Aquitaine. No, the, these, are, these are the intemperance. Intemperance. Yeah. Yeah. And. We were talking earlier, and I very unique in terms of what you've done on the uh, footer of this cigar. You can see there's a little bit of um, exposed binder there. Why don't you talk a little about that? Yeah, so there's two reasons for it. Um, the, the first reason is because uh, when we started working with the Atapadaka, it's very hygroscopic, so what happens, it absorbs humidity fast and releases it very fast. So when you roll cigars, the tobacco is very uh, humid, and when you cut the end off the cigar, uh, it's rolled longer and it's molded longer than it normally is. And when you cut the end off the cigar, what would happen is the the, the autoponic would shrink up a little bit, and you would end up with you know a sixteenth of an inch or so uh, of, of shrinkage, for lack of a better word. So what we learned, uh, the, kind of the hard way, is that uh, the best way to do autoponaca is to let it age for a little while before you cut the, uh, the, the chevetta cut, the, the picaduro off the end of it. So when we started seeing these though, which was kind of an accident, uh, Mike and I commented how it, it kind of looked like the root system of our brand uh, on the tree. And then we also um, talked about how when we blend cigars, the wrapper is such a, a dominant part of the flavor profile. So if you're making fine-tuning adjustments in the blend, it's hard to tell sometimes because it's hidden by the wrapper whether whether there's a there's a, a problem in there. It's like somebody in a choir who's singing a sour note, and if you listen really close, you can hear it. But if you just if you're just you know not paying attention, it's easy to miss, right? So uh, when we blend cigars, we roll the cigars where there is a uh, about a, a half inch of just filler. Uh, with with a, with a with with a, an extra piece of uh, of the of the dominant filler element as a kind of a, a wrapper a binder for some lack of a word, but it's still a component of the filler. And then we use the the next section, the next half inch is binder and filler, and then the rest of the cigar is all three. And then that way, when you smoke the cigar, you experience um, the the contribution of each element of the cigar, is it? That, that's really, I mean, that's, that's amazing. That's just amazing. Well, I mean, maybe it's because I don't have that sophisticated of a palate. Right. Um, Mike smokes predominantly medium cigars, so he can taste down into the mild range. Right. I smoke predominantly stronger cigars, so when I taste cigars, uh, what what I'm, I'm very good at picking out elements when it's a really powerful cigar, because I'm used to those elements, so I can, I can taste cigars in that range. 
it's kind of like uh, like like music, right? It bases in this decibel and uh, trebles in this right. in these frequencies, and uh, and you know I just I just hear more in in the in the bass frequencies, and, and my kind of you know hears more in the or tastes more in the in right. the treble, right? So that's I have to do it in order to understand how something's changing the blend. So you know what we've done is given a little bit of that experience uh, to the customer. So that the first, you know, eighth inch or so of the cigar is just the binder and filler. Exactly. That's yeah. great. Now, um, your cigars, I mean, really the buzz came about through online media, which, uh, and, and it's just kind of steamrolled. Why don't you talk a little about how you've used online media? Yeah, so if you look at my Twitter profile, I joined Twitter two days before Hurricane Ike. Because there was a local reporter and a lot of friend of mine, friends of mine who were in Galveston, either stuck on the island or without any kind of communication, um, who were able to to send Twitter messages um, to give updates about here's what's happening on Post Office Street, here's what's happening uh, on the island in general, because um, they were closer to what, what was going on. Because I was up in Austin, and uh, I had heard about Twitter from Doc Stogie Fresh. Uh, he had started tweeting at, at IPCPR like a year earlier, but I wasn't really sure I understood exactly how to use it. So I got on f to get these messages from from uh, from Galveston, and Doc was on there, and so I kind of started looking who Doc was following, who was following Doc, and I found this community of people. And what what I was kind of dealing with after the hurricane, um, I guess, kind of like a form of depression, I guess. I mean, it's like losing a child. Um, I was dealing with a loss of the of the fellowship, the relationships that I had with my customers. Right. So I had these customers who would come in, and I had relations with them, and I looked forward to coming down on the weekends and spending time with them. So what I found on Twitter was that what people call the brotherhood, brotherhood of the leaf or whatever. What I found is a, is a group of people who I had never met, who I started to build relationships with. People like Jerry Cruz, people uh, like uh, Patrick from the Stoney guys, um, just all these guys, I mean, in normal, normal cigar smokers, right. you know, um, who, who had also found Twitter. And I think since then it's really grown uh, in the three years and, you know, 70-something thousand tweets later. Right. So even before I was making cigars, I was engaged and friends with these guys. So going back to the first Cro-Magnon shipment, when they knew that we were making a cigar, um, all those people automatically were like, "Hey, I'm interested in trying this because I really—if you say it's good, it must be really good, right?" Or you know, I'm not going to make something that I don't smoke, right? So um, you know, so I really am a strong believer that 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 Twitter is a tool, Facebook is a tool for engaging customers engaging friends, people, and then if they're customers, then so be it. Um, you know, we have a Romacraft account for kind of some marketing stuff, we have other things, but like my personal account is private, I, I really only uh, accept followers that, that are cigar people, and you know, I use that primarily just to engage, and I think because we've learned, because it was a true... Um, thing that I wanted to do to build that those relationships with people as a fellow cigar smoker, it just made it a natural thing. Uh, a byproduct of that is that people became familiar with our cigars and uh, you know at the end of the day the reason why we are where we are is because of social media. Yeah, that's absolutely. I mean today at the show, I mean we're in about 35 stores. We're probably gonna add about 20, 25 stores at the show. Um, some of those may not ship till next year, but almost every single one of them or well, all of them are either a store that I have personally visited and enjoyed and lot and it felt like it was a good fit and, and, and had people who, who worked there who engaged their customers the same way I did when I had a store or they're retailers that I am not familiar with who other people I, I know like you or Keith or someone else says hey this is my local store these guys would be a great fit for you right so through those two mechanisms, uh, every store we have, we, I feel, are, are really supportive of our brand, but they're also a good fit for us. Right. Not not every store is a good fit. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, to kind of wrap things up, um, 
you, you really have a good pulse in the industry, and just from this conversation and our conversations previously, uh, I'm impressed. What are your thoughts in terms of trends we're seeing in the industry right now? You know, um, I see kind of behind the curtain now. I mean, I had been smoking cigars for 20 years, and and I I thought I understood a lot about the business. And what what I know now is that I, I didn't know anything. Now I know a little bit, and if I'd spent 20 more years doing this, I might know you know half as much as someone like John Drew. Um, you know, so one of the things that I that I really see is that there's tons of tobacco available and not all of it is good and there's a lot of competition for good tobacco I used to see lines come out the show and I would think oh well there's all these Sumatra lines coming out because customers really love Sumatra or there's all these Connecticut lines coming out because everybody loves Connecticut when the reality is that in that point in time that's a tobacco that's readily available so the big guys buy a lot of it that's really good and they use it for a while to, to maintain a consistent line the small guys buy as much as they can and make the cigar as long as they can um, so if there's anything uh, when I see all these small guys I have a lot of respect for what it takes to keep a cigar consistent and it's very 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 tough I mean, we probably spend two days a week uh, doing nothing but looking at where are, is our tobacco going to come from 16, 18 months from now? So what I would say in terms of trends, um, you know, there's a lot of Connecticut cigars coming out, uh, fuller Connecticut's. Hopefully that breaks the <laughs> the perception that Connecticut's are just mild cigars. Um, I think there's a lot of a lot more innovation in the packaging. It seems like uh, people, and I don't mean gimmicky imitation. Right. I mean, like, for example, I was just talking to Mike Argenti, he's got this new fat soap, which are these really big ring gauges, but because he's flattened them out, they're a little more easy to smoke. Right. Um, but he's got, you know, he's got a beautiful little box with the holes in it, and it, it looks really sharp. So a box doesn't have to be, you know, gilded and fancy to be innovative. You know? um, so I, I like that. I think they're opening their eyes a little more to social media uh, or to new media people. I, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it's all about connecting with your customer and our customers are connecting through social media so if you're not engaged in social media uh, then you're just missing the boat right so uh, you know I don't know I haven't had much chance to go around the show but uh, you know hopefully the trend is and I think this may be a multi-year trend hopefully the trend is customers are more sophisticated customers are more educated therefore you can't bullshit them like you used to Right? You have to make good product. You can't make up these fanciful stories about this mysterious bill of tobacco you found. But customers know. And so it, and they have better palates. And they can smoke a cigar and they may not know exactly why they like it or don't like it, but they know what they like. And so and I and, and so I think if anything the biggest trend I've seen maybe over the last couple of years is cigar makers have to be more legit. You know, there's, this is the biggest show apparently they've had ever. Uh, more uh, people displaying. A lot of these guys won't be around in a year. Hopefully, we're, we are. And hopefully, we're not one of them. But the only way to stay around, I mean, is to do do it right and to, to continue to do it right forever. Because as soon as you stop doing it right, the customer will catch on, and uh, the trend will be that people will be going out of business. So, and, and you deserve to, right? I mean, if you don't, if you don't do it right, you, you know, you have no inherent right to be in business so absolutely absolutely skip i i appreciate the time this was a, a wonderful conversation thank you so much you're welcome i know man. i learned a lot from this and oh, no. um, <laughs> roma craft tobacco um, you're gonna be hearing a lot more from these guys so thanks everyone this is will signing off